Tyler Matheson. Uh, I am the co-host of Power Lunch, where they don't serve lunch, and we don't have much power. But, <laughs> but be that as it may, I will say that, that I'm so happy to be here today because it, it, it really brings together one of the things that I enjoy most about my work. And I've been in journalism one way or another for really 41 years now. Uh, and I get up every day uh, very thankful that I get to spend my day learning. And that's what I'm going to do here today. I get to spend my day uh, with people who know a lot, uh, who do some really very exciting things, whether it's in the, uh, the stock market or investing, or in this case, in healthcare. Uh, and, and I can learn a lot every day. And so if you're a curious person, uh, as I am, a day like this, where you're going to be able to sit down with a, a couple of uh, real uh, leaders in their, in their fields, is, is my, kind of, uh, my kind of playground. Uh, what I will promise you today is that I know less than virtually every one of you in this room about the topics that we're going to talk about here, and I certainly know less uh, than Uwe and David uh, know about the uh, areas that they work in. So I hope that I'm able to ask just dumb enough questions uh, to uh, bring some enlightenment to what you all are doing, and so we're glad that uh, both of you are here. Uwe Schoenbeck is the Chief Scientific Officer for External Science and Innovation for Pfizer, and David Chernoff uh, is the uh, Chief Medical Officer at Setpoint. We're glad that you both can be here with us today. We're going to spend about a half an hour uh, talking about some uh, different areas uh, uh, that, that they are working in and uh, hopefully uh, explore some, some innovations that are very exciting. So Uwe, let me just begin by letting you talk for a few minutes about two things. Tell us a little bit about who you are, what you're doing, and right now, what is the most exciting area of innovation that you are exploring or that Pfizer is exploring? And then I'll ask you, David, the same question. Thank you. Talk about hyped up expectations here. Um, <laughs> trying to live up to it. Good morning. Uh, I'm Uwe Schoenberg. I'm heading what's called external science and innovation within Pfizer R&D. It's basically an aggregate of uh, the mostly externally focused uh, activities within R&D. So we have the classical BD-related uh, search and evaluation function uh, in our group, which reaches from academic research collaborations to consortia to the typical licensing and acquisition activities with biotech or pharma. Um, we also have a group that focuses really on target generation, uh, works very closely uh, in that space of uh, human genetics, mouse genetics, computational biology, really rejuvenating the pipeline with uh, innovative, truly differentiated uh, targets. Uh, we have an executive branch that works very closely with academia called the Centers for Therapeutic Innovation. Some of you might be familiar with them. One is here in New York, others are in Boston, San Francisco, San Diego. The concept here is that we work very closely with the academic PIs and uh, their labs to advance what's typically an early stage concept into a more robust clinical proof of mechanism and do so together in a way that neither of us could do alone, really. And last but not least, um, we have a couple of vehicles available uh, that allow us to do um, spin-outs, seed investments, new core formations, and working closely with other functions and finds, and also more the classical Series A or Series B venture investments. So it's really, I would say, the externally <coughs> focused uh, activities of uh, worldwide R&D within Pfizer, working very closely with other lines. And you know, in that role, you see a lot of different innovation, a lot of different um, new things coming up. And I really enjoyed the, the talk uh, a little bit earlier here today. A lot of the things you mentioned certainly apply for us as well. It's always a fine balance. You can easily get very excited about something really new you just don't know much about because it's so early, it's so exciting. It's always green, right? Um, and you have to find the right balance about um, where's real excitement with applicable um, potential versus where it's excitement that you know, might be something you need to monitor a little bit more. And for us, um, you know, I think what's important uh, piece is we have built a lot of our activities on the classical therapeutic modalities like small molecules, large molecules like antibodies or vaccines. And um, you know, someone said earlier, healthcare system will change. And I think that's certainly true, no question about it. But it doesn't mean things that have worked in the past won't work anymore at all. There will be some pieces that still work, and you know, I'm a strong believer that small molecules and antibodies will still have their place going forward, but 
we see is huge potential in new therapeutic modalities. Um, gene therapy being one of them, gene editing, I saw CRISPR, some of the slides up there, maybe a little bit too green right now for us, but uh, certainly potential there. Uh, cell therapy in various different forms uh, from the CAR T cells that have really shown breakthrough um, activities in patients uh, to stem cell therapy, which is again probably a little <coughs> further out for us. But I think that's where we see really strong interest and have made significant investments very recently, um, you know, in the hemophilia space, but also going beyond rare diseases in that setting. And to be quite honest, I think it's the first time we have seen actually the potential for curative approaches. Um, be it through the CAR T cells, be it through some of the gene therapy. You know, we don't know the very long-term benefits, whether it's 10 years or lifelong um, benefits with gene therapy. And gene editing certainly holds even more of the curative potential. I want to get David into the conversation, but because you brought up CRISPR and gene editing and gene therapies, uh, I gather that the FDA has gotten involved in that area and kind of slowed it down a little bit. Am I, am I right about that or put on hold some uh, sort of um, areas of inquiry there? And, and how is regulation going to either foster or retard the innovation in that important area? Yeah, no, it's, it's a good question. I'm not sure I would say it has really slowed things down significantly. There's a strong interest from the agencies in learning. We all learn at this point, it's early days still. And I think the key piece is gonna be working together, being transparent from both sides, working closely together and really finding the best way of going forward. I mean, if you think about gene therapy, for example, we all remember you know, uh, the Geldinger case uh, 20 years back, and that has really, uh, put a very significant damper on this exciting area of science. And I think we have been, rightfully so, very cautiously advancing gene therapy efforts. And just now, over the last three years, you see more and more uh, programs advancing to the clinic and therefore engaging the agencies in those discussions. So I think we need to be cautious from both sides. We need to work together closely. And as far as I can see it, that's the case. David, give us a sense of what you're working on today uh, in, in bioelectronic medicine and, 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 and what has got you most excited about what you're doing in terms of the potential to make a difference that Michael talked about sure. at, at the top. So I'm Dave Chernoff. I'm uh, uh, the chief medical officer for Setpoint Medical um, in California. Um, I've had a long career in rheumatology starting uh, at Bellevue as a student here quite some time ago, coming to UCSF and becoming a professor and then having the opportunity to work with people like Sue Siegel on a number of startups. And um, what interested me about this, and I joined about a year ago, was um, I got a call from Mark Genovese, who's a professor of rheumatology at uh, Stanford and who I'd worked with for many years on diagnostics and other approaches to treating autoimmune disease, and he said, you should take the job as chief medical officer for Setpoint in bioelectronic medicine. I said, what are you talking about? I don't know anything about it. And I usually am fairly aware of most things that are ongoing. Um, and I, I, I came out to the Feinstein and, and met uh, Dr. Tracy and spent several hours with him, and I, my head was kind of spinning after that uh, interaction, and I did some calls with people that I had trained with who are very uh, well-known scientists. And I flew down to uh, Burbank and, and, and drove up to the company, and I took the job, and I, and I have never looked back. And, and the reason I think this is so interesting and so transformative and so disruptive is um, back, back in the day when I was in Professor Weissman's office uh, at Bellevue, we used to treat patients with RA with high doses of aspirin. And we knew it, that they had enough aspirin in their system because they couldn't hear you anymore. That was, <laughs> that's, that's how we titrated it. And then as a fellow uh, at UCSF, um, we started to use methotrexate, really transformative for the treatment of RA and other autoimmune diseases like psoriasis. And then the advent of biologic therapy targeted uh, molecular entities, uh, monoclonal antibodies, first against TNF-alpha, and then against other moieties like IL-6, um, uh, co-stimulation co uh, inhibitors, um, and then the, uh, the new generation of small molecules, Janus kinase inhibitors, um, first from Pfizer, um, uh, very effective, very immunosuppressive molecules. So we've had this incredible sea change and, and incredible transformation of how patients are treated with autoimmune disease. But we've reached sort of an asymptote where 
All these medications are extremely effective, but they don't work in a lot of patients. And uh, they're very immunosuppressive, and they cause recurrent infections in, in a subset of patients. So what we have now is an incredible array of almost like chemotherapies for, uh, for autoimmune disease without the molecular precision of diagnostics that's been brought to the area in oncology. We don't have the, the companion diagnostics that we do, but we use very similar drugs. And many patients uh, are, are auto-discontinuing their medications. So there's a phenomenon now, it's not the physicians, but the patients after being on Humira or Embril for 10 years said that's it. They either can't afford it anymore, these drugs are extremely expensive, they cost 50 or $60,000 a year, they have to be injected, um, they, they cause side effects, and many patients simply do not comply with them uh, after a number of years of therapy or they lose effectiveness. So there's a substantial fraction of patients who simply uh, cannot tolerate these medications. And when I spoke to Kevin and learned about the innovations uh, and, and the innovative research that he was doing at Feinstein and how he's able to tap into something that, that evolution has provided us, that the immune system senses inflammation in the body, one of the ways it does that is through the vagus nerve, and if you amplify the signal or you uh, stimulate the vagus nerve with, uh, with devices uh, that we can implant, you can uh, augment that system to reduce inflammation in a very different way than introducing a, an inhibitory small molecule or a monoclonal. And we've now uh, uh, conducted trials both in Europe, in Crohn's, in RA, and we're now conducting a uh, trial in the United States where we're implanting uh, little micro devices like this, this micro regulator, into the vagus nerve of patients with drug refractory uh, RA. And uh, we believe that this will be a completely novel and disruptive approach to the treatment of autoimmune disease. I want to come back to, to what we know about how these bioelectronics uh, work and, and what the, how we know they are succeeding. Uh, and what that potential then leads to. But Uwe, let me turn to you, because you talk about, about uh, uh, your work in, in genetics and, and using gene therapies uh, as part of the healing process. Do I understand correctly that a lot of or many gene therapies aim to, to correct a defective gene or redirect a gene, uh, and once you've done that, you've done that? So, the, yes or no, I mean, explain it to me because I don't know enough to ask intelligently, but if that's the case in some cases, how does a big profit-driven company like Pfizer make money off of that if it is a one-and-done kind of therapy? Hmm. So it depends a little bit how you define gene therapy. Some folks define it very broad, others more, more stringent. Um, gene editing itself would go to the point that you mentioned of really mm -hmm. fixing a defect gene or trying to fix gene a editing. defect gene. Um, I don't think we're ready for full gene editing approaches yet. The potential clearly is, is huge. Uh, you could go to many non-rare diseases, potentially large indications, large unmet medical needs. Gene therapy right now, the way it's being pushed, is mostly replacement uh, therapy. So you have defective products from genes that you're trying to replace by inserting an intact gene that's gen producing the right protein. So hemophilia, for example, the correlation factors, factor eight, factor nine, do exactly that. Um, the virus goes mostly AV, goes mostly to the liver and produces the right protein there. Big advantage for hemophilia is you only need five, 10, maybe 15% of the normal level of the correlation factor to have basically normal life. Um, so that's really more replacing a defect product than really exchanging the gene. Once we get to gene editing, and many of you have probably followed the uh, recent news around this, there's way more controversy around the long-term benefits, but also risk that come with gene editing per se, and CRISPR in particular, selectivity, specificity of the enzymes plays a role. Um, I think from our end, from my end, uh, also personally, I think that's something we're certainly very excited about. We're doing some exploratory work around, but that's still more ways uh, to go before that's really ready for, for prime time. So David, take us through a little bit and, and, and briefly the, the, the similarities and the differences in how one would use uh, bioelectronic uh, approaches to, 
to medicine and pharmacologic approaches to medicine, and, and what do we know about how bioelectronic devices like the one you're holding in your hand, uh, how, what do we know about how successful they can be, right. and, and, and what is the potential they have, right. not just to treat, but to diagnose uh, uh, situations? Right. So uh, again, the, these devices and this approach to treating autoimmune disorders is really a therapeutic modality rather than a diagnostic, although there are some diagnostic applications like looking at heart rate variability, autonomic dysfunction as part of that. But uh, this approach really is, uh, is augmenting something that we all have that's evolved for many millions of years, a way of sensing inflammation through the nervous system and then uh, stimulating uh, very selected pathways to downregulate inflammation. It, and it is fundamentally different than introducing a targeted molecule that knocks out, for example, TNF-alpha, which we all need uh, to protect us against infections like tuberculosis. So if you are put on one of these monoclonals, you must be screened for tuberculosis because you can react with, in the absence of these molecules, you reactivate infections that could be fatal. So these are all immunosuppressive drugs. And, um, and the patients that we've been treating uh, uh, have all failed conventional therapies. The first approach, like in a cancer patient, they failed uh, conventional chemotherapy, they go on an experimental agent. So we have seen in published trials that were conducted in Europe, in Crohn's and also in RA, people who had failed three, four, or five different drugs who were put on this bioelectronic uh, therapy with implants and showed very, very dramatic reductions in their disease activity that, that was maintained for up to two years. And some of those patients went into remission. And that's, now it's not, a, it was not a blinded controlled study, but it's very rare for someone who's failed four or five different monoclonals to go into remission. So okay. what do these little bioelectronics do? So the, 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 this, this, How do mi they work? this microregulator, which is a, a, a small electronic implantable wireless device, is implanted in the, in the vagus nerve in about a 45-minute outpatient operation that's usually done by neurosurgeons. And once it's implanted, it is programmed with an iPad to deliver a digital dose of electricity, which is like a pill, but it's a digital dose. As Sue was mentioning, everything's digital now. So we can program these things to deliver a certain amount of electricity or uh, energy to the nerve once a day or twice a day, and it's wirelessly charged. And the way we monitor these patients, we look at their disease activity by a clinical exam. We look at their disease activity with a molecular profiling, a blood test to look at whether the uh, inflammatory markers are going down, and we also look at their joints using quantitative gadolinium MRI scans, similar to the machines that uh, come from GE, to have a quantitative evaluation of what's going on at the joint level. Uwe, as you look at what your business, Pfizer, is doing um, in terms of, of innovation and research and development, what to you are some of the areas where you're moving toward, and what are some that you're moving away from. What, do you, what, what? Where are you putting your dollars and your time and your people, and what are you pulling back from? I think what we've seen across the industry is an increasing focus on disease areas. Not all companies in the same areas, but each company really focusing because the competition is increasing. You need to be really placing your resources in a more competitive manner, more density rather than spreading too thin. Um, you know, for us, the core areas are in the oncology space, the autoimmune space, uh, rare diseases, vaccines, um, and metabolic disorders, NASH, and uh, other liver diseases as well. I think what we have seen is, you know, in the old days, you had pharma be pretty much mostly small molecules, if not 100% small molecules. Then you saw more of a 50-50 split between small molecule antibodies. Now you're seeing more and more split, you know, with other indication areas as well. But I think in all of them, what we're trending towards is truly differentiated mechanisms, ideally disease-modifying mechanisms, not just treating the risk factors anymore, which also from a, I think, payer perspective becomes more and more relevant, and smart delivery. Um, you talked about the side effects of small molecules, antibodies even. Um, as more as you can do target the delivery, 
smart targeted delivery. I think as more you avoid some of the side effects and focus more on the benefits uh, of the drug. So we use a lot of nanoparticles these days across the industry, but that's not what I would call truly smart. There's still some ways to go to really have them targeted to specific tissues, cell types, even activation stages. And actually, in some ways, uh, microelectronics is being used uh, or considered at least in that, that space as well. Are there, I mean, you, you work in, 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 in inflammatory situations, right. uh, uh, clearly. Um, is Pfizer moving away from certain areas of medicine, uh, like neuroscience uh, or, or others, that, that they just have decided this is not our fort right now or where we want to invest? Yeah, I think what you might be referring to is we announced that we shifted our investment for neuroscience from mostly internal to mostly external investment. Mm -hmm. So the investment itself still is very strong. It's just the way we do it is different in that sense. More so you have outside external, partners. External partners, biotech okay. companies, academics, things like that. We do a lot of the work there. I think in general, um, you look for indication areas with a huge medical need, where the patients really uh, depend on new drugs. Maybe nothing is out there. What's out there is really um, not sufficient, not satisfactory. And you made an example about RA, for example. I agree, there's still lots of areas for improvement for patients out there in RA, um, including other autoimmune diseases. So I think it's really about identifying where's the, the unmet medical need and where can you drive uh, truly differentiated drugs towards, rather than saying there's a huge area we wouldn't touch at all. Talk to me a little bit, and I want to come back to you in just a minute, David. Uh, Pfizer is a huge, huge company. Uh, you obviously have partnerships with small biotechs, I assume, many of them. Um, where, where is the innovation really taking place? Is it in the big companies? Is it in the, in the smaller biotechs? And, and what is the potential of those, biotech, those smaller biotechs to make a difference when they partner up with a company of scale like Pfizer? Yeah, I think my personal experience has been the combination of the two. So Pfizer, as you said, for some reason, we're really more known as a commercial powerhouse than a science powerhouse. That typically, that impression changes once you had a chance for a scientific exchange with biotech companies. I think we do a lot of outstanding research. And I think more recently, we've given also more credit from the, from the street about our pipeline and that's evolving, which is great. Um, I think the innovation truly takes place where you have two complementary parts coming together that can do something jointly that neither of them can do alone. So the biotech company and the pharma company, the partners, have really both pieces that need to come together. If you have just one part, typically either you best leave it alone and let them continue to develop it because they have done well so far, uh, or you do it in-house. But I think the biggest innovation that we have seen is really where you can bring two parts together and work on it truly jointly, very transparently, very openly. And that's, you know, I think something that's more evolving over the last few years than you might have seen 10, 20 years ago, where it was more about, you know, give us the asset, give us the IP. We're, I'm looking at the clock, and we right. don't have 51 seconds. We have 55 seconds left. <laughs> so I'm, gonna, I'm just going to wrap it up by asking each of you, because there's a lot more depth that we could, we could get into here. Uh, in your field, or more broadly, your choice here, jump ball, make one big prediction for what's going to happen in your field innovatively over the next three to five years. What would your prediction be? Well, I think over the next three to five years, we'll see uh, an increased number of novel small molecules uh, beyond the, the Janus kinase inhibitors, which will be targeted chemotherapy. And I think at the same time, we'll be able to combine those approaches with uh, bioelectronic medical approaches. So what was done in the field of movement disorders with deep brain stimulation, and what was done in the field of epilepsy with drug refractory epilepsy being treated with vagus nerve stimulators, we will be able to accomplish in autoimmune disease as well. They're complementary. Uwe, what's the big prediction? I, I agree with that. I would add to this, I think, if we're talking about the big, big picture, I think um, truly curative disease modifying therapies will become more and more prevalent um, because I think the payers are asking for it, rightfully so. The patients are asking for it, rightfully so. And I think we will use any therapeutic modality that's available to achieve that. Final question is you get to ask him a question and he gets to ask you a question. <laughs> okay. You go first. So the bioelectronics piece, uh, you're focusing on RA. Right. 
Where do you see the future horizon of that? And where do you see it maybe not fitting? Well, uh, uh, I was an inflammation cell biologist when I was a Yale undergraduate, and I thought, what is that going to amount to? And then many years later, <laughs> everyone's talking about inflammation. <laughs> and, and I My think, doctor talks about inflammation. It's the great enemy. It just, it just won't That's go. not good if your doctor talks <laughs> about it to you. <laughs> you might want to be careful there. But. And um, I think, you know, the, the, there's, the sky's the limit because, as you know from Paul Ritker's work recently with uh, IL-1 uh, inhibition and using anti-inflammatory drugs to treat heart disease, like we've used Lipitor to treat heart disease, there's a whole new generation uh, and way, and, and it's, even bioelectronics could treat heart disease. So I, I think that uh, there's, we just have to focus and do a good job in certain diseases and then apply it to others. But it's not just autoimmune disease, it could be cardiac disease, pulmonary disease, where conventional medications have limitations. And do you have a question for Uwe? So of all the programs, you uh, are in charge of a, a very large array of, of complex programs. What, can you pick one or two that, are the, that to you are the most exciting? I have my electronic stuff, but what do you, what do you have? Yeah, so for, first, first I thought what do the, you exa have, okay. the example you brought was great because I spent my postdoc time working on IL-1 and cardiac disease, actually. <laughs> so um, for me, I would have to say gene therapy. Uh, the partnerships we have established, the in-house efforts we're developing, um, you know, the first data that you see in hemophilia patients that are treated once um, and achieve uh, levels that allow them to be completely off any injections um, for years at least, if not lifelong. It makes a true difference if you meet these patients, if you talk to these right. patients. Um, it's really an accomplishment, I think. Um, that at the end we will be proud of and, and I really enjoy. And I'm looking forward to expand that further. Great. Gentlemen, thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you. Thank you. David, thank you. Uwe, appreciate it. Thank you. Thank, you. Thank, you. thank you so much. Thank you so much.